Okay, so hello everyone and thank you for the invitation to speak on this channel. It really is a pleasure to be here. Today I'd like to present our zone, our vision at Zona for a use-based approach to commercial satellite navigation and to introduce some details of our system, which we call Pulsar. So the presentation is broken into four parts. First is, you know, what are the user requirements? You know, what should we be striving towards in terms of system performance uh, to meet the use, to meet the needs on the horizon? With these requirements and the technology ecosystem of today, how would you build a satellite navigation system that meets those needs and that best leverages the aerospace industry, uh, particularly with a focus on commercial and civil users? This forms the motivation for our approach at Zona, where we'll speak to the rollout plan and target level of PMT performance. And last, I'd like to speak about our first demonstration satellite near Hugin, uh, which launched in May of this year, so that would be May of 2022. So to start with the user needs, um, historically, new technologies and modes of transportation brought new navigation challenges, which has resulted in many new technologies to support them. A hundred years ago, maritime made use of celestial navigation, giving kilometers of position and accuracy. Thirty years after that, in the Second World War, we see the first radio navigation systems to support aviation uh, with hundreds of meters of accuracy. Thirty years after that, we see the first satellite navigation system to support the Cold War. And of course, now we have a joint meter level location thanks to GNSS. And the question is, what's next? And the reason for choosing this 30 centimeters uh, point on the end here is that it really does follow the natural progression. And if you plot all of these onto you know, a sort of position capability over time, you really see that there is a Moore's law of navigation. And we see that about every 30 years or every generation, there's approximately a 10 times improvement in largely book available location accuracy. And it also suggests that in every generation, there's an investment in new infrastructure. And that infrastructure was driven by a new need. And so you might ask, what is that need today? Well, in my view, this is intelligent transportation systems. These are really pushing for decimeter or better performance. And in my view, satellite navigation holds a lot of potential as a ubiquitous solution to support all forms of autonomy, you know, whether it be on land, at sea, or in the air. And an important aspect here is really a common reference frame. As these systems must ultimately work together to achieve the highest benefit through things like information sharing, uh, they must also share a common reference uh, in, in the physical space to interoperate. And satellite navigation offers that common vantage point at this world scale. Now, the requirements for self-driving in terms of positioning are still developing, but work from a Ford Motor Company that I was a part of indicates that 10 centimeter, 95% accuracy is what's ultimately going to be needed for full self-driving. And this has even stricter requirements for safety. We're talking about 30 centimeter protection levels at the kind of one failure in a billion miles type of number. So this is needing to know your position at that 30 centimeters uh, to kind of the five or six sigma type number. So these are very stringent requirements uh, that uh, are kind of new to the automotive realm. And so with these user requirements in mind, you know, how might you architect a commercial satellite navigation system today? And I'd like to start with a comparison of a few of the requirements and a few of the differences than in the approach typically taken in GNSS for I'll use GPS as an example just because it was the first one, it was the first one deployed, uh, really architected in that kind of 1970s aerospace ecosystem. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list, but just something to highlight some of those differences. And the first one is really the user group. Um, you know, we'll focus on commercial users, whereas, you know, of course, in, in GPS, it's, it's like government users are a big part of its focus. That's not to say that civil users are not part of its focus, but there is certainly a, a lot of focus on government. Um, next is accuracy. Uh, GPS was designed to drop five bombs in the same hole. Uh, today, commercial users want to keep their car in their lane. In terms of availability, both want global performance, but commercial users are more focused on population centers, so you know, enhanced capability there. In terms of interference, both are concerned, but one with state level actors and the other with smaller personal privacy devices. And the last one I'll focus on here is really the user equipment. You know, commercial users are really targeted at mass market deployment. And tables are great, but I'm very much a visual person. So let's take a look at a diagram to see how to see what design decisions result from these requirements. And so we'll start with GPS and we'll start with that five bombs in the same hole. This translates to about 10 meters RMS positioning. 
Next, we take a look at the space segment, uh, where it turns out that you know, specific kind of government and military requirements call for a very stringent radiation hardening of these of these satellites. Uh, things even beyond what's what's found naturally in the orbit, really to be you know hardened to things like tactical nuclear strike because of the the nature of, the, of these assets. So these are very stringent requirements in, indeed. Uh, another military requirement is that the system must operate without access to the ground for several weeks. Um, and this is in the event that the ground segment is, is incapacitated. And this is where the atomic clock requirements on those satellites starts to come from. It's, it's the need to maintain that holdover synchronization autonomously uh, between those satellites for several weeks and still maintain you know, good capability there. Another strategic requirement, at least at one time, was the kind of, uh, ability to have a daily domestic uplink to the satellites, so that is to control that satellite from home soil. And so this already rules out things like geosynchronous orbit because those types of satellites would never necessarily stay over their certain parts of the world and be difficult to be in touch with them. And so this brings us to the question of, well, which orbit do we choose? And the trade-off was that the satellites had to be radiation hardened. They had to have atomic clocks. They had to be built in that kind of 1970s, 1980s aerospace ecosystem. And so the result was is that MEO won over LEO. And the reason was that the satellites were going to cost you about the same because the, the cost of them was, was driven a lot by those some of those other factors. And you needed about 10 times less of them deployed in MEO compared to LEO. And so launch cost went over build cost. And this is very much the model that's been followed since GPS, why in many ways other government GNSS constellations have, have looked similar. And so for a commercial system, you know, what might you do differently? And so you can start by removing some of the specific government requirements. For example, we can assume that commercial ground services have very high uptime, uh, so you can remove the multi-week holdover requirement uh, from the satellites and as a result, remove the atomic clocks, uh, which results in a lower cost and complexity space segment in general. Next, we can remove the stringent radiation hardening requirements, you know, making satellites instead radiation tolerant uh, to their space environment. And then this leads us to the choice of the orbit. And ultimately we want is an orbit that really offers three things. We want an orbit that offers higher receive power for the end user. Uh, this generally pushes those satellites closer to the earth. Uh, we want fast geometry change for fast PPP convergence, which we'll talk more about later. Um, this turns out to also push us closer to the earth. And the third is really we want a low cost space segment, which in today's ecosystem really means leveraging the launchers, the satellite components and the supply chains of the Leo mega constellation, so the likes of Starlink, OneWeb, Telesat, and others. And so from both from a performance and from an economic standpoint, these factors are really pushing us towards a low Earth orbit. And so the result is a commercial satellite navigation system in Leo with low cost satellites produced in high volume with largely off the shelf space capable components. These, sat these new Leo satellites are are also not bound by legacy. So they can be inclusion of things like encryption and data authentication and other services uh, as part of those offering for commercial users. And a commercial Leo layer such as this can really add capability that can evolve quickly on say a five year time scale, which is sort of associated with the, the lifetime of those satellites uh, to keep up with the pace of commercial demand. And this is just much more difficult to do with existing GNSS because they're already supporting billions of devices and they just have a you know, big inertia to large changes. And so you can see there really is a complementary nature between these MEO systems uh, uh, provided by government and these kind of Leo uh, commercial systems. And so this new space approach to satellite navigation is very much the mindset that we've taken at Zona. And of course, building such a you know, constellation and such a, you know, a commercial navigation system uh, takes time. And so we do have a stage rollout plan with different levels of commercial service planned along the way. Uh, phase one is a deployment of around 40 satellites. This offers a one view GNSS enhancement service over population centers. So in addition to providing you know, data services and providing things like GNSS corrections, uh, it also brings you know, additional ranging signal to the mix, which is resilient and secure. Um, and furthermore, it brings time transfer for stationary users already you know, providing a lot of value to things like critical infrastructure. Phase two is around 70 satellites. This offers the same service as in phase one, but now of course globally, uh, filling in the, the gaps at the poles and at the equator and offering more satellites at those mid latitudes. Phase three is around 300 satellites, uh, which is this kind of final deployment and these, with these first two being stepping stones towards that. Um, and this gives you know, global GPS level you know, satellite visibility and satellite geometry or dilution of precision. 
and, and really brings a capability that offers you know full positioning uh, in a standalone sense, but also uh, offers a lot of enhancements the GNS has to work alongside it as well. Uh, what does this look like as a business? Uh, this, of course, is a question that comes up very often. Um, well, it turns out there's and folks on this uh, sort of uh, watching this video, of course, know this well, is that there's already a large market established for high performance GSS from the correction service providers. And our business model is very similar in the sense that we're building and operating the infrastructure. In, in this case, it's the, uh, the satellites uh, and the signal in space, uh, working with chipset and receiver manufacturers to integrate our capability into their devices. Uh, to offer a service to the end user on a subscription model, which can take a variety of forms. To show some details here, um, here's a snapshot of the expected one in view availability in phase one, um, showing the coverage really targeted at those population centers. So what this shows is the availability of one satellite in view. Um, you can see that that's um, really concentrated in that dark teal section, kind of at those mid latitudes. Uh, in phase two, this is expected to be global. Um, so really this map just becomes one color, uh, kind of in teal, uh, where we have high availability everywhere. In phase three, um, with the number of satellites that you expect this to be more similar to what you see on GPS. So on average, something in the kind of 15 satellites or so. And on the right, we show the expected satellite distribution or satellite visibility distribution, I should say, as a function of latitude. Where you can see the focus is really on those population centers with more satellites generally in view at those mid latitudes. But well, all the while still providing a, you know, sufficient satellite visibility globally to, to provide those kind of positioning services. And an important, important point here is, is really that Pulsar is meant to be used you know, alongside GNSS to, to, so that in combination um, it can you know, deliver a solution that's really truly robust for, for many users. And to show an example of how this can be used alongside GNSS, um, this plot shows the expected convergence of precise point positioning uh, using float and ambiguity fixing techniques. And you can see that initially, even with the inclusion of a one in view Leo satellite, which is sort of representative of our phase one deployment, you can reduce the flow convergence time by nearly a factor of two. And in the long term, with ambiguity fixing, it becomes you know, almost instantaneous, you know, the level of tens of seconds. And so what's powerful here is that you know, this is something that's truly global. This relies on just the rapid geometry change to get that convergence. It doesn't rely on kind of local density, local high density atmospheric maps. Uh, or, or other information to, to get that convergence. And so what's exciting here is that this is something that really would work uh, truly global. Now, this is still in simulation, but you know, proving this out leads us to our, our next section, which is our demonstration satellite. Of course, putting something in space uh, to, to really put, uh, put these kind of simulation results to the test. Our first satellite demonstration mission was named Hugin. This was launched on SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in May of 2022. Uh, which is transporter five. Um, here you can see the payload undergoing environmental testing. So that's what's shown all the way on the left. You can see the kind of antenna array there, uh, which generates those PNT signals. Um, in the center here, you can see the uh, separation. You can see the actual launch itself. And on the far right, you can see the separation from the launch vehicle on orbit. It's pretty cool. Uh, SpaceX you know, streams all this stuff live. And if you're interested in checking this out, that's, uh, that's all on YouTube as well. And really the high level objective of this mission was to showcase that a payload suitable for deployment on the VO small satellite can produce PNT signals of comparable quality to GNSS. And so this is really to challenge the paradigm that only governments can tackle this problem. And now it is the familiar form of 30 satellites uh, in MEO with atomic clocks, but instead showing that something different, you know, uh, done by a commercial company can also move the mark with, with something interesting here. Now, of course, satellites are just one side of the equation. Uh, this demo mission allows us to foster partnerships and user equipment side as well to really close that loop uh, on the Pulsar ecosystem. Um, we're excited to be working with several receiver and signal simulator manufacturers and developing uh, prototype equipment. Uh, in terms of public announcements, we recently announced a, uh, a memorandum of understanding with Hexagon, uh, with Novotel receivers demonstrating early support for zone of signals. Uh, and we've also announced a partnership with Spire Federal to simulate zone of signals to aid uh, in future receiver development as well. So particularly useful in simulating that full constellation uh, prior to launch. And so that's all I have here for today. So thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, please do feel uh, free to reach out to the email below. And just want to say thank you again, all again for your time and for the invitation to speak here. Thank you very much.